is prayer, antidote to the days of Lot. And I don't think I need to spend any time at all convincing you that we're living in the days of Lot. The world around us, uh, evidence is enough, doesn't it? That we're in those times, and we know from the signs around us that it, it, it won't be very long and our Lord Jesus Christ will be in the earth to correct all of the evils of this world. So what's, what's our position in, in relation to the problems that beset this world? We want to talk about the, the antidote to the times in which we live, and it is prayer, and that will be our theme uh, for tonight. So, I want to start in Matthew 24. So if you just come back in your Bibles a little way to Matthew 24, we have here the Olivet Prophecy. Now, the Olivet Prophecy is in response to the questions the four disciples that were with the Lord on this occasion asked him as they looked across at the temple. And, of course, it can be divided into two distinct parts. Uh, from uh, the beginning of his answer in verse 4 to verse 29, part A, of that verse is the events surrounding AD 70 and the overthrow of Judah's commonwealth. And then 29b, that is the last few words of, of verse 29 through to basically the end of the chapter, uh, is in fact in relation to his second advent. Okay, so I'm not going to go into that. But the verses I'm going to look at are actually in that section that have to do with AD 70. So the, the exhortation given to people who lived in that time, in our Lord's time, is relevant to our time as well. The same principles apply. So we have here verses 12 and 13 of Matthew 24. And we will see the relevance of this as we read it, because it says, And because iniquity shall abound. Now this word iniquity is the Greek word anomia. It means lawlessness. And Young's gives us that meaning. And that, that, of course, is something we see in our world today. Divine law is simply thrown out the window, isn't it? There is a a lawlessness, not only with divine law, but with common law, just a general lawlessness in society. But it's getting worse. It says it will abound, and the word abound means to multiply, and we've seen it multiply exponentially, haven't we, in, in the last couple of decades, especially through technology. It's multiplying. Then he says, because lawlessness shall multiply, the love, and that word love, as you're probably aware, is agape. It's got to do with sacrificial love, the kind of love where you commit yourself to a cause, that love, he says, shall wax cold in many. Now, this idea of waxing cold is very interesting because it's the Greek word suko, which means to cool by blowing. So if I wet my finger like that and blow on it, it's cooler on that side than it is on the other side. And the reason for that is evaporation. So as the moisture evaporates, it, it cools things. That's why we have evaporative coolers in Australia, see? Well... Think about that. What the Lord is saying here is that the problem will be that the multiplication of lawlessness, this continual blowing of this cool, chilling breeze upon his servants can have the effect of sapping their zeal and their love. All right? Now, you think that's an appropriate exhortation? I think, sadly, we see evidence of that in our own community, don't we? We see people whose love for the truth has faded away in these very difficult times. So we need an antidote, don't we, to, to this? We, we, we've got to have an antidote. Now he goes on to say this, <clears throat> but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And the word endure there is uh, hupomena, it means to remain behind after others have gone. Right? So you've got people whose love has been cooled, but he's saying, look, you need to do something about this. You've got to endure. Others will leave, but no man should take your crown. Okay? You've got to remain behind after others have gone. And he says, if you do this, you'll be saved. Now, the, the, the Greek grammar here is very interesting. In, in the Greek, uh, there are three voices. We only have two in English. We have, a, we have an active voice and a passive voice. The Greek has a middle, but the middle's not used here. You see this here, this word, suko, wax coal? It's in the passive voice. Now, the passive voice is where you are the receiver of someone else's doings and actions. Now, we can't help it, can we? We're in the world. <laughs> and this cool, chilling breeze is blowing at us. What can we do about that? Well, we can, there's certain things you can do to sort of shut some of it off. But it's coming at us, isn't it, from all directions. So we're just the victims of other people's actions. 
basically. But when he says here, he that shall endure unto the end, that's in the active voice. And the active voice means that you are the doer of this action. You have to do something about this. And if you do, you'll be saved. Are you going to save yourself? No. That's in the passive voice. God is going to save you. You'll be the recipient of his action. When Christ comes, he will be the one who saves you. Okay, so that's a very, I think that's a very important little exhortation that our Lord gave to his own disciples who were facing awful things in their day, just as relevant today uh, in our circumstances. So with that, we can go back now to Luke chapter 17. <clears throat> and there we have this, this wonderful uh, exhortation, which though it has an application to his own generation, as you'll see from the very last words of Luke 17, verse 37, he says, uh, wheresoever the body is, or the carcass is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. And we know, of course, that the standard of the Roman armies was an eagle. And they came in 1866, they backed off in 68. Those who had listened to Christ's advice got out. Many of them went to a place called Pella, across the Jordan, uh, into what we call modern Jordan today. I've been to Pella. Uh, it's not a bad place. It's pretty, pretty dry and barren, but it's not a bad place to take refuge. And many went there, see. But some didn't take his advice. And those who stayed behind ended up in the Holocaust. And it was a Holocaust. Because he says in Matthew 24, nothing like this is ever going to happen again. The, 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 the horrors would never happen again. It was just unbelievable what they went. People were eating dead bodies and, oh, you know, we won't go into that now. Um, but it was an awful situation. So you see, that's a reference there where the, where the carcass is then you'll have these birds of prey, the Roman armies, are going to pick the flesh off these carcasses. So, yes, there's an application to AD 70, but when you explore what he's saying here, the, the real application, the most important application, is clearly to the latter days. I mean, this principle applies in all times, but it, it, it's designed for you and me, as we shall see. Now, there's something interesting. As we read through that, from verse 20 uh, to the end of chapter 17... The term day or days occurred very frequently. In fact, it's there ten times. It is there in the plural five times, and it's there in the singular five times for a total of ten. Now, I think you all realise and fully understand that when we have the number five, we are talking about divine grace. It is the number of God's grace. And so what, what's being said here is that the days, plural, are days of opportunity that we are given. Like God gave 120 years in the days of Noah, remember? Those were days of opportunity for people to get their act together, to make sure that their focus in life was right, that they were on the right path, that they were heading for the right objective, see? Days of opportunity. And if you treat them that way, they are indeed days of grace, aren't they? But then you've got the singular day. And that's the day when he comes again. That's the day of judgment. That's the day of destiny. Right? That's when our future is determined. And so you see, if we've done the right thing, if we've, if we've realised the value of these days of opportunity, or as Peter puts it, that we should account the long suffering of God as unto salvation. Remember he says those words? Yes. Count, count the fact that it appears to be delay. It's not delay. God set the day. It's not going to change. He's not going to shift the goalpost. Right? He's got the day. Christ now knows that day and they're working towards it. And we can see their hand working towards it, can't we? It's not going to shift. Right? It's going to come. And if we have set our course aright in life, when that day does come, it will be a day of grace for us. And we will enter into the kingdom. That's, that's, the, that's the simple message that we have just in this term. Days and days. So this singular day occurs five times. It's the time of grace for the saints and the judgment of the world time of very difficult, uh, you know, evil time for them, but a time of great joy uh, for us. So when we read in this section of scripture, you see there, let's just come down to uh, uh, verse 22 of Luke 17. He says, he said to his disciples, the days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you shall not see it. Now, the days he's talking about there was his days with them, see? This was days of opportunity for them, wasn't it? And they should have made the best of it. And 
It also applies to us because we're in the days, as it were, the Son of Man, the days that He has given to us, uh, that we might uh, be prepared for His coming, just like it was in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. We know what Sodom was like. Ezekiel 16 tells us this about Sodom. It says, This was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. Now, that might not be true in North America, certainly in America, because you only get two weeks holiday a year when you start your employment, and you, you work up, I think, what, three or four eventually? Well, if you start work in Australia, you get four straight away. And you also get... <laughs> And, and also, of course, you accumulate every 10 years with the same employer, you accumulate three months long service leave. So when I, used to, you know, when I had a family and I used to bring my children over here to North America and they knew that I'd been five weeks in the UK for a Bible school or two of there, I'm coming over here for five weeks, Brendan would say to me, how do you get all these holidays? Do you work? Oh, yeah, I've got to work, I've got to support a family. I just happen to be in the fool's paradise of Australia. Okay? <laughs> And so I had accumulated long service leave that I could draw on. It is a fool's paradise, by the way. But this was the problem of Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. She didn't strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were haughty, it says, and the word is arrogant. And I think we see a certain arrogance in society today. We certainly see basically general prosperity. Now, not everybody's a millionaire. We know that. All right. Some people do struggle. But if you stand back and have a look at the civilization as a whole, it's a totally different world to the world that my parents grew up in. My mother and father were Depression children and Second World War children. My mother came into the truth because of her poverty and the misery of life. That's why she, stuched, that that's why she sought something different and better than what she had. She said, there's got to be something better than this. And she went looking and God made sure she got it. Okay, and then she eventually, with my dad, when she married him, they got six of the ten children, including her, into the truth. And then finally, when my grandfather died, uh, my grandmother came in as well. One of those children was John Martin. You might have heard of John Martin. Okay. Yeah. So um, my, my mum was the first of the Martins in the truth because of the misery of the times. And even when I was a child, there was, there was difficulties. I, I won't tell you the things I had to do. You'd, be, you know, you'd, you'd laugh. But... It was awful. Today, we have got a world of prosperity. We can go down the road to a thousand restaurants and, you know, got all the pleasures in the world. Most of us are pretty well off, okay? And that was the problem with Sodom. Fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. It doesn't lead to good outcomes. And Christ knew that. And this is why we've got this exhortation of his in Luke 17 and 18. So what were they doing in those days? Well... Each of these, the nine phrases used of what they were doing, we read verse 27, because it's about the days of Noah. He says, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, and so on. Same with verse 28, about the days of Lot. Similar sort of things. There are nine phrases used here of human activities, and they all have the same grammar in in the original Greek. The verbs are in the plural number, imperfect tense and active voice. Now, I'm not going to give you a Greek lesson. This is not the point of what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you, want to, you, you really want an accurate translation. You know, let's, let's seek an accurate translation. The imperfect tense describes an action which has begun, is in progress, but is not yet completed. Right? That's why you use the imperfect tense. You use the perfect as past. All right? It's gone. Done. Imperfect is it's in progress but you don't get to finish it. Now, that's important, because he talks about the prosperity, and this is why he chooses these two eras, both eras of divine judgment, aren't they? He could have chosen any number of eras of divine judgment. He could have likened it to 8070. He doesn't. He says, what's going to happen in your day is quite different than past judgments. In the days of Zedekiah, when God brought judgment on, on Judah, it was awful. You know, shortage of bread, famine, you name it, all right? Same, same in 87, not going to be the case today. It's just going to be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. So when we, when we get an accurate way of interpreting this language, a literal translation would be, they were eating, they were drinking. 
Now, by eating and drinking, of course, he doesn't mean the kind of eating we've just done upstairs. You know, you sit around the table with your family and have an evening meal. He means restaurant-type eating. I mean, the, there, weren't, there were virtually no restaurants when I was a kid. I thought it was great to get 20 cents worth of fish and chips. You know, that was it. Today, there are a million of them, aren't there, of restaurants. And you, you can just go down the road and they serve you, right? He's not talking about normal home life. He's talking about the, the, the lavish lifestyle of the modern society that we live in. That's what it was like in the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Same with drinking. He's not talking about just drinking. He's talking about pub-type drinking, you know, entertainment-type drinking. That's what he has in mind here. So they were eating and they were drinking. They were marrying and being given in marriage in the days of Noah. And in the days of Lot, what were they doing? Verse 28 says, they were eating, they were drinking, they, they were buying, they were selling. See the idea of the grammar? They're, they're actually doing these things. And he says, they were planting and they were building. But they didn't get to finish it. That's the point he's making. So you just imagine, in, on the day that the angels, in the evening when they came to Lot's house, remember, by the morning the next day, they had to grab them by the hands and lead them out because they were dilly-dallying. All right, you imagine that day. Think about that day. It looked like any other day, a normal day. And all the folk would go down to the local uh, coffee shop and they would order their latte, which is what a lot of people do this, don't they? They order their latte. And they would be sitting there quietly and just sipping on their latte and kaboom! The whole thing goes sky high. Alright? They didn't get to finish. And it's going to happen again like that, but not with a cataclysmic overthrow, but with a massive collapse of the financial system. So you'll have people doing what they did on the 29th of October, 1929. They were jumping out of tall buildings in New York and other places because all of their wealth disappeared overnight. It was gone. All right? They were selling Model T Fords for a dollar in the street. Were useless, worthless to them. Now, it's going to happen again. We're on the brink, we're on the brink of the greatest depression in human history. President Obama left office. He never told the public what was in the papers that were lying on his desk, and he probably tucked them in the bottom drawer. He had reports from 16 agencies, including the CIA, including the FBI, including the Army, etc., that the world was on the brink of a 25-year depression. He knew that two years ago. Right, and it's much closer, it's two years closer to what they were saying was going to be a 25-year depression. And it's coming. Because you see, the prosperity of Noah's day collapsed in a week. It was gone. God closed Noah and his family in the ark, and within a week, when the rain started, all their prosperity disappeared. Same in, in Lot's day. In one day, it all disappeared. Okay, that's what's going to happen again. And it won't be a very nice time because that will be the beginning of what Daniel 12 verses 1 and 2 tell us will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation upon earth. That's what Isaiah 60 is about when it says that the earth will be covered in gross darkness. Not just darkness like it is today, but gross darkness. Because those who carry the light will be taken out. They'll be at the judgment seat. So the world's going to descend into a horrible time. Which is why we should be preaching the gospel as hard as we can, because we want to try and extract as many people out of that as we can, because it's going to be awful. Thankfully, you and I will be at the judgment seat in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, and hopefully, if we've used the days of opportunity wisely, it'll be a day of grace for us. So this is why, this is why this context is so important. So all of their prosperity disappears uh, in a day. Now, we're missing a little bit there, but you can probably pick that up when you're just missing the part of an E on the end there as excessive. Um, so, let's just step back. What we had here, you can see this unfolding, eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage, buying and selling, planting, building, and, and so on. And it all disappeared in one day when the saints were taken away. Just like the angels came to the house of Lot, they're going to come to our houses. Well, I want to point that out here in Luke chapter 17. So, as I said, there's a common denominator between these two days, the, the, these two eras of Lot and of Noah. It is prosperity. That's an interesting thing that in Luke chapter 17, 
Christ doesn't mention violence. He doesn't mention immorality. Right? There's no mention of that. Now, not that that wouldn't happen, because it has happened. But he's not interested in that aspect of it. He's interested in one aspect. Prosperity. That's why he says, remember Lot's wife. Was she mixed up in immorality, Sodom? No, don't think so. Was she mixed up with the violence? She witnessed it. Was she mixed up with it? No. Like you and I. We see it, but we're not mixed up in it. He knew the danger was being so fixed to your current way of life that you're not prepared to walk away from it happily. Right? And we must be prepared to walk away from it happily, to leave it behind, N not to look back. She looked back. We know what happened. So we, we've got to be cautious. So this is his warning to us in the latter days. Because that day's going to come, you know, and the crash is going to come, and away we will go. And there'll be a ten-year period in this time of trouble that will lead us to Armageddon, and Armageddon is sort of off the, the side there. This, uh, we've, obviously, it's not working perfectly, but anyway, you, you, get the, you get the idea. We've got ten years between the resurrection and Armageddon. You know how we know that the resurrection and the time of trouble are concomitant events? Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2. I might just take you there. Rick. Should we do that? Very quick. Just don't lose Luke 17. We'll be back here shortly. Daniel chapter 12. So we read in Daniel 12, verse 1. I want you to notice the phrase here. And at that time shall Michael... Now, Michael here is the title of Christ. Michael, of course, was one of the three individuals in the universe who had the right to forgive or condemn. He did that in the wilderness. You know, he was God's personal representative, the angel of his presence. Yahweh, of course, the, the God of Israel, is the other one, but the third one is our Lord Jesus Christ. He's taken over from Michael. He now controls the angelic host. That's why he's called Michael here. He's coming as a judge. All right, so Michael shall stand up, that great prince which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, notice the phrase? You've got two phrases here. And at that time. It's telling you something. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that is found written in the book. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. That's the resurrection. Okay. So they are concomitant events. The resurrection of the dead and the collection of the responsible living, which hopefully will include us, okay, is the time of the beginning of the time of trouble, such as never was. That's why we can say with some confidence that this crash that's coming is going to be huge and it's going to be very, very painful for our world. I don't want to be here and neither do you when that happens. But thankfully we're going to be in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is how depressions happen. 1929, there was a stock market crash. On the 29th of October, by 1930, there was a worldwide depression. It took them 10 years to dig themselves out of it, and then only by a war, because with a war you can close a lot of mouths, you don't have to feed them, and the rest you can put to work making armaments to kill more people, so you don't have to feed them. Okay, that's how you get out of depressions. I mean, it's callous, but that's, that's the way it works. And it's coming. It's overdue, in fact huge financial crisis is, is long overdue. It's, and it's overdue in the sense that we think it's overdue, but God has appointed the day. It will come when he is ready. So it will come, and the end of that will be another war, and that war will be Armageddon ten years after the resurrection of the dead. Now, a lot of factors at work. I'm not going to go through all of that, but there's a lot of factors at work that will bring that day. And this man could well be, he could well be, in power for this very reason. If he does just 10% of what he's threatened to do, like, for example, impose a 45% tariff on Chinese imports, right? even if he imposes a 10% tariff on Chinese imports, he will push the world's economy over the edge. Okay? So he could well be in power just for that reason alone. Time will tell. One thing we do know, he's not there by accident. Right. He's been put there by God for a reason. And of course you get reports like this. The world knows it's coming. This was uh, in, in a Time magazine. They reprinted the Milwaukee Leader, probably long since defunct newspaper, I don't know. But they, they printed, printed 
printed the front page of that paper on the 29th of October 29 when the stock market crash occurred. And they said things like this. In the more than six years since the 2008 Wall Street crash, nothing has been done to rein in the abuses of the parasites in pinstripes that were its cause. Another crash is inevitable. This guy thought it would come at the end of 2016. He was wrong. But I know there's thousands of commentators who are saying it's coming and it can't be very far away. So I'm of the, of the firm conviction we're very close to the return of Christ because that is what Christ is talking about here. Now, what will that crash trigger? International bankruptcy will force radical and rapid change in our world. Middle East peace will be achieved at last. Bankruptcy will allow, uh, allow even more rapid Russian expansion without any effective opposition. They've got away with it now, <laughs> haven't they? You, you imagine when, when America, for example, is totally bankrupt, which it will be with its $20 trillion debt plus its $150 trillion uh, unfunded liability debt. So out of that will come a group of papal-backed nations, 10 of them in Europe, in southern Europe. We'll get our Roman Empire back. And Israel will come out of that reasonably well. They will remain prosperous in fulfilment of Ezekiel 38, verse 12. So, you know, we're not very far away from these great events. So when the call comes, let's have a look at Luke 17, verse 31. It says, In that day he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return. Now the housetop was designed for prayer and meditation. You know, and it was based upon the altar of incense. Okay? And we'll just, I'll, I'll just give you a little picture on that in a minute. So what Christ is saying here is that when he comes, he expects to find people who are praying and meditating. That's what, that's what he's saying. Because when a, when a man came in from the field in ancient times, because the houses of the Jews were designed on the, the basis of the, of the altar of incense, which spoke about prayer, you used to have a, 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 a set of stairs outside so that the, the man would come home and he would go up onto the housetop and he would pray and meditate about his obligations in the house. See? So when he came down, he wouldn't just barge up and open the door and say, how are you, dear? He would actually spend some time meditating, and then he'd go down to the house to fulfil his obligations in the house that evening. That's the way it was done. Well, intelligent people, anyway. You knew why God made that provision. So Christ does expect to find people that are praying and meditating, but he also expects that there'll be a danger because he says here, he which is upon the housetop and his stuff in the house. Now this word stuff is the, is the Greek word skuios. It means implements, equipment or apparatus. Now I don't think he, really, he, he was looking down the, the corridor and saying, well look, I'm worried that these Christadelphians might rush down, as it were, from the housetop and grab hold of their refrigerator <laughs> and try and, you know... <laughs> Get that out of the house. But I'll tell you something that they might want to take with them. It's called a smartphone. All right? But I would suggest you leave it behind. You know why? About 18 months ago, I took a group of brethren and we went, dangerously, we went into the Sinai, which of course is now infiltrated with ISIS-type people who shoot up tourists, etc. Okay? We went into the Sinai, we went to Mount Sinai, and we stood in front of Mount Horeb, which is where we're going for the judgment seat, by the way. There's plenty of accommodation there because there's no tourists. All the hotels, and the, they're all vacant. There's plenty of accommodation there. Okay. I'll tell you something, you won't get there. You don't get any phone receptions. So leave, leave your smartphone at home. You won't need it. Okay. That's, you know, the, we, we can make a joke of that, but is, is it not a problem today that people's lives, especially our young people, <coughs> Their lives are governed by a smartphone. They can't do without it. By the way, I'll let, just remind me to give you a, a, a video by Simon Sinek on, on millennials um, before I go. And you'll find it quite, quite interesting and, and funny. So he says he's worried about the gadgets. And they're the gadgets, aren't they? They're, they're the type of gadgets that, that people are likely to grab. So this is the warning to us. Now, the order of incense was like this. So... Back in Exodus 30, verses 1 to 7, they were to overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, the sides thereof, round about, and the horns thereof, and thou shalt make unto it, says, a crown of gold round about. Now, this 
crown of gold that you can see here, mean, the, this word means a border or a, or a circlet, this actually was to match the balustrade that you had, uh, or your parapet that you had on the top of your house. So you could go up there and you have a balustrade around it, just like the, the crown on the order of incense. So we know what the housetop is about. It, it, it is about prayer. But then we have his exhortation in verse 32. Remember Lot's wife. So there's a struggle, isn't there? In her life, there was a struggle between the housetop and the stuff in the house. So this is the Lord's exhortation to the last generation of Christadelphians. Lot's wife tried to secure the present and lost the future. This is why we've got in our Bibles, verse 33. It says, Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall, shall lose his life shall preserve it. Now, what that means is about priorities, isn't it? By saving your life today, it means, like Lot's wife, she wanted to preserve what she had. She didn't want to leave behind. She put more store on the present, on the things of the present, than she did on the things of the future. And so she's lost the future. No question about that. But if you're prepared to lose your life today, that doesn't mean that we've got to go out and beg on the streets. And I drove through Baltimore today and I couldn't believe the number of beggars, you know, on the street. I don't mean we're going to do that. We've got to have a house to live, we've got to bring up our families, etc. But it's a question of priorities. You know, where's your priority? Is it on the things of the future or is it on the things of the present? Can you say in your mind that when the angels come knocking on your door that you'll be happy just to walk out and to leave it all, not to look back? But that's we've got, to, we've got to get to that point. How do we get to that point? Well, this is why we've got Luke chapter 18, which follows straight on from Luke 17. And we'll get there in a, in a minute, and we'll see that the Lord's antidote is prayer, persistent prayer. As the days get worse, we need to upgrade. We need to improve our performance in the matter of prayer. So we'll come to that in due time. But first I want to talk about the judgment seat because that's what he's talking about here in the end of Luke 17, verses 34 to 37. Now note something curious. See verse 34. Remember that ten times he's used the term days, plural, and day singular, right? Now he changes it. See, verse 34. He says, I tell you in that night there shall be two, and the word men in, in the King James is in italics, there's no equivalent, he doesn't mean two men, he means a husband and wife. He's just been talking about Lot and Lot's wife, so we know he means a husband and wife, see? And these two are responsible for judgment. There are two in one bed, the one shall be taken and the other shall be left. So why does he change it to night, do you think? Why not just keep the, the term day, which he's been using right through this context? Well, he wants you to go back to Genesis 19. He's just told us about Lot's wife, all right? He wants you to go back to Genesis 19. And what do you read in verse 1 of Genesis 19? You read that the angels came to Lot's house when? In the evening. That's when they're going to come to your house, all right? Now, if you have two responsible people like Ryan and Julia in this house, there's going to be two angels turn up because we've each got an angel who's been recording our life since we were baptised. He knows all about us. He's got the record. He's got to interview us before we come before Christ. Okay, so two angels will turn up at your door. And it will be in the evening when you can most expect people to be home from their daily grind. Okay, that's, that's the simple thing he's teaching. But don't expect a phone call from me. Okay, <laughs> you know why? Because I'll be going 15 hours before you do. And there's no reception at uh, Sinai, and I'm not taking my smartphone. <laughs> so don't expect a warning call from me. So this is, I mean, we, we, can, we can smile about it, but it's going to happen very soon. And we need, we need to face up that it will happen very soon. So two in one bed, a husband and wife, a clear allusion to Lot and his wife. Two grinding together, so there's two labouring to feed others in the truth. And it says, and the one should be taken and the other left. Now, just as a casual reading of that, you'll say, well, yeah, I understand some being taken, but what does it mean to be left? Well, we know this. No responsible person will be left behind, will they? If you're responsible to judgment, you're going. Regardless of your standing, you're going. 
So Lot's wife will be the judgment seat. So what does it mean then? Well, the answer is in the meaning of the Greek words that are used here. This word taken is the Greek word paralambano. It means to receive near, that is to associate with oneself. It speaks of an intimate relationship. And the word is used of taking a wife to oneself. Now that, that word is used in Matthew chapter 1 in verse 20 and 24. And that's about Joseph, who when he discovered that Mary was pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit, he being a just man, he was going to put her away privately. And the angel has to intervene and say to him, Fear not to take Mary unto thee as thy wife. Fear not to take her as thy wife. That's your word. This word actually means to be taken into a marriage. Lot's going to go to the marriage. He's going to go to the right hand of Christ. He's going to be immortalised with all those on the right hand. He's going into the marriage, to the Lamb. Lot's wife is clearly going to go to the left. She's going to be put out of the marriage. That's why the next word, the other shall be left, is important. Because you see, that word is atheami in the Greek. It means to send forth, to leave, to depart from, or to abandon. It is used of separation in marriage in 1 Corinthians 7, in verse 11, 12, and 13. <coughs> you know, when Paul says, let him not put her away. Remember that passage? That's your word. In other words, it means to put someone out of a marriage. So here you've got Lot, who goes to the right, he goes into the marriage, and here you've got his wife, who goes to the left, she's put out of the marriage. That's what he means by being taken and being left. It's about destiny. They ask the question in verse 37, where, Lord, that is, where are they left? Well, in the case of the AD 70, those who didn't didn't follow Christ's advice, were left in Jerusalem and they died there, many of them. Okay. But what about Lot's wife? Well, where was she left, ultimately? Where she wanted to be. Yeah. And she became a pillar of salt. She was left in the place they preferred to be. So what's going to happen to those on the left hand is that they're going to be shooed away. The last, one of the last acts of the angels is to guide them away and to shoot them into outer darkness, it says. Which probably means Europe. But they're not coming home to watch TV. Okay, that's, that's what it's saying. I, I fear that because my French is not very good and uh, mm-hmm. I don't particularly want to go there. But that's, that's you know, this, this is the exhortation that, that Christ is giving. Now, what can we do to make sure that we're ready? Well, that's why chapter 18 flows straight on. There is no chapter division here. Chapter 18 flows straight on in the parable of the unjust judge. Now, it's a very curious parable because the Lord uses hyperbole. Now, hyperbole is where you deliberately exaggerate. You, you say things which sound ludicrous, but you're doing it for a reason. Okay? So, this is, not, this is not a natural scene. Well, Christ often will use a natural scene for parables. He takes the fabric from a natural scene, from a court scene, you know, a courthouse, but he deliberately uh, goes out of his way, using hyperbole, to exaggerate. He does it for a reason, as we'll see. We're going to just go through and have a look at this. Have a look at verse verse 1 of chapter 18. They miss a word out here, the translators. It says in the King James, And he spake a parable unto them to this end. In actual fact, they, they missed out the preposition that's here, K, and it should read this way. He spake also a parable to them unto this end. You know, what it's saying is, this is connected with what we've just read in Luke 17. See, there's a, there's a vital connection here. This parable is about what he's just said in Luke 17. That's your context, right? So when you've got that, then you can you can see why he is going to exaggerate here. To this end, yeah, it means that that men ought. Now you can delete the word men. It just just means it is necessary. It is necessary always to pray and not to faint. And that word faint means to lose one's courage, to lose heart, to be faint-hearted. 
Now that I think is a real danger, isn't it? At the end of the days, to sort of think, well, how long is this going to go on? You know? And we go on day after day, and we, we, you know, I get people saying, but you were talking about Christ coming in 1979 when your daughter was born, and now she's got four children of her own. All right. Well, I did say that. Yes, yeah. <coughs> I did believe Christ was coming then, but I, it's a lot closer now, isn't it? <laughs> a whole lot closer now and we can see from the signs the convergence of events we know we're right at the end so you, you can sort of become discouraged as time passes and as difficulties come down on you yeah. but we've got to make sure we're not faint hearted so here's, here's your uh, antidote now Brother Carter writes brilliantly on this parable in his book wonderful book it is too Parables of the Messiah if you haven't read that I would recommend it he writes this about this, uh, this uh, parable of the unjust judge. The background of the parable is the idea of a time of waiting, of apparent delay, which would be perplexing to men of faith in every age. The conditions of the world would be conducive to disappointment and despair, when disciples might lose hope in his coming again. Tragically, you know, I've heard of some recent cases where people, baptised people in their late 20s have just resigned and gone off into the world. That's happened. Okay? It's very, very sad. Jesus therefore prescribes the antidote to counteract the effects upon the disciples of the conditions prevailing around them. Men must pray, must keep in touch with God. Prayer, earnest and continual, in faith expressed, keeps the mind fixed on divine things okay so th th that's a very useful quotation so here's our parable verse 2 there was in a city a judge a certain judge which feared not God neither regarded man so he doesn't have any phobia that's what the word is phobio there's no dread of God it may be a reference to a Roman judge a godless pagan we don't know but he regards not God or man. No respect. And there's a widow. Look at verse 3. Now she's the antithesis of the unjust judge. He's all powerful. He has no fears. She's been ripped off by whoever. Maybe Pharisees. We don't know. But she's been ripped off. And she's coming to get some kind of, of justice. Verse 3. There was a widow in that city. And she came unto him saying, Avenge me of my adversary. <coughs> So here she is, exact opposite the judge. She's a pathetic, totally dependent figure, often oppressed, as we know, by the scribes and Pharisees. And it says, <clears throat> she came unto him. Now, literally, it, it could be rendered, and she was coming, because, you see, it's the idea of continually and repeatedly coming to him. Saying, avenge me. Vindicate me of my adversary. Now the word here in the Greek, antidikos, means an opponent at law. So she wanted some satisfaction from the treatment she was receiving. Verse 4. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, so he doesn't say this publicly, he says it in his heart. He said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, Yet because this widow troubleth me, and the word means to wear him out with toil, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming, that is, see Rotherham's translation, lest by her persistently coming, she weary me. Now this is, this is where you get this exaggeration. Because the, the, this Greek word, which we see here, rendered weary in the King James, is actually the word hupopiezo, which only occurs in one other place, in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. Now, 1 Corinthians 9 is where Paul, in that context, is talking about the Greek games. Right? And, and he's talking about what they did in the Greek and Roman games when they had uh, you know, combatants in an arena. And sometimes there were boxes. And, and, and he uses this figure. He says, I keep my body under. Remember that? He says, I keep my... I don't beat the air, he says. I'm not like a boxer, shadow boxing. I keep my body under. He's not talking literally. He's talking about the spiritual keeping of his body under by crucifying the, the flesh with its affections and lusts. See? 
But that's the word he uses. It actually means to beat black and blue. To give someone a black eye. Now think about this. You see, you've got to get a picture in your mind. There's exaggeration here, but it's very important exaggeration. Here's this judge who, you know, he doesn't fear God or man. Huh. He hears a knock on the door of his courthouse. He goes out and this little woman, can you uh, vindicate me from my opponent, that law? No, get out of here. Shuts the door in her face. All right. Ten minutes. Knock, 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 knock. Opens it up and there she is again. And this goes on all day, every day. And he gets, he begins to think, you know, one day I'm going to open that door and instead of her making an appeal, she's going to go boring and give me a black eye. <laughs> now, of course, it's not going to happen, is it? But you can see the exaggeration is deliberate because what Christ wants us to think about is the power of persistence. Right. The power of persistence. Now think about that because you see he wants his disciples to think about it. Notice verse 6. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. Now, well, of course they heard it. Because he's just been speaking a parable. You know what that's telling us? He told the story up to the end of verse 5 and then stopped. And he looks at his disciples. And he says to them, did you hear what the unjust judge said? What do you reckon he's doing? He's asking them to reflect upon the message of this exaggerated parable. And the message is clear, isn't it? The message is you can be very weak, right? you can be under oppression, you can be in a difficult place, but if you keep persisting, even an unjust judge who has no fear of God or men will in, end up doing something for you. What about our God? What about our God who's neither unjust, right, or beholden to anyone? What about him? Will he respond to persistence in prayer? Well, of course he will. He might not give us the answer we want straight away, and that's why we read the next passage. You see verse 7? And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him? Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Day and night unto him. Though he bear long with them? Do you think that that might mean that he puts up with us? No, it doesn't mean that. It's the Greek word macrothumio. It means long spirit or forbearing. In other words, what Christ is saying is that we're not always going to get an immediate answer to our prayers because the timing's not right. God's timing is always perfect. So we'll ask, but we've got to wait because when he's ready, he will step in. Right? That's what he's saying. And it might be... It might be a long time before he steps in because he'll get the timing right. When the time comes, he will act. And when he acts, it will be speedily. That's the, that's the clear message. So this is a very important exhortation, isn't it? What he wants in us is that persistence in prayer, day and night, appealing for the things that have to do with what he wants to achieve in us. Not what we want, but what he wants to achieve in us. And we keep asking. We'll get our answer in due time. And it will probably come out of the blue, and it might not necessarily be something that we'd ever even think about. But it will be what's necessary for us. That's the message. But what about verse 8? <coughs> verse 8 says this. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Yep. It'll be very sudden. You know, when those angels walk up to your door one night, it'll be sudden. Because by morning, you'll be in another place. There'll be no catching a 747 uh, to the Middle East. And we'll go by angelic transport. They are able to go from the Father, who lives somewhere in the middle of the universe, wherever that might be. It's light years, probably thousands of light years away, right? We don't know. 
that they could go from his presence to ours like that. Just like the disciples went from the middle of the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum like that. Just like Philip went from the Negev to Ashdod like that. That's spirit transport. I have no idea. Don't ask me the science of it. All right, But it happens. And we will be taken out of the front door and the next thing will be standing, our feet will be at the foot of Mount Horeb and our destinies will be determined in the next 12 months. That's, that's what's in front of us. So what kind of attitude should we have knowing that that's going to happen soon? Look what he says in verse 8. I tell you he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, this is his concern. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh. Now you know, this phrase, the Son of Man, is a very important title. I've often pointed out, and I ask people to check me out on this. This is not about his humanity. The title of the Son of Man is drawn from Psalm 8 verse 4, which is a kingdom psalm, it's a millennium psalm. It's about Christ ruling as king over all the earth in the company of his bride. That's what Psalm 8's about. Okay? It's about the restoration of the dominion that was lost by the first Adam. He restored it in himself, in his sacrifice. He's about to restore that dominion in you and me and in the world in the events of Armageddon and ultimately eradicate sin and death. He's the one that will do that. That's why he's called the Son of Man. It's always got to do with him exercising divine authority on the earth to overcome the problem of carnality and sin. That's what that title's about. That's why he comes as a judge. He's given the title to be judge because he is the Son of Man. He's the restorer of the dominion lost by Adam. It's a very, very important title. He's talking about him coming as a judge. Right? When he says, when the Son of Man cometh, he's coming to determine our destiny. That's what he means. And he says this, Shall he find faith on the earth? Now it's often pointed out, and correctly so, that there's a definite article here. Right? There is a definite article in the Greek text. But the translators, I think, have done pretty well. Because he's not actually talking about the faith. You know, you've often heard, haven't you, Brethren, point out that, that this is saying, the question is, when Christ comes, shall he find the faith on the earth? And what they're really meaning by that is, when he comes, will he find people that believe the truth? You know, that their statement of faith has, contains the truth, and that they believe it. Well, he is going to find those people. We know that. There are many, many passages about that. I can take you to Ezekiel 47, 22, 23, and show you that there will be faithful Christadelphians whose children are going to go with them into the land. They, the adults, will be immortalised, but the children will go in as mortals and inherit in the land. What does that mean? It means that there will be faithful Christadelphians, believers of the truth, when Christ comes. That's what that means. Revelation 16, 15 implies the same. Luke 12, 37, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. All of those things imply, all of those passages, clearly imply that when Christ comes, he will find people in possession of the truth. That's not what he's asking. It's not what he's saying here. What he's saying is, when he comes, will he find this kind of faith? We, get, we just used the wrong article, that's all. We shouldn't use T-H-E, we should use this. Will he find this kind of faith? What kind of faith? Well, the kind of faith revealed in the parable by this poor old widow who kept on coming persistently, appealing to the unjust judge to be vindicated. He's saying, will he find that kind of persistence amongst his people? Will there be people praying day and night unto him, crying out like Lot did for redemption? You know what Lot's cry was? You know it says in, in Genesis chapter 18 when, when Abraham stood before the angel he said I'm sending down my two fellow angels and we're going to go down and see whether or not the cry of Sodom is as we have heard. Well, what was the cry of Sodom? Was it the, was it the sinful people that were crying out? Well, they might have been. They might have been in, you know, engaged in rock and roll. But that's not what it means is it? The cry of Sodom was the plaintive cry of Lot. He couldn't move from there. His children were married in the city, right? He was stuck there. Like, we are stuck here, aren't we? Largely. 
What was he crying out for? Divine intervention. Right. He wanted divine intervention. And that's, that's what we should be crying out for every day. Divine intervention, and it's coming. And when it comes, it'll come so quickly, it'll take our breath away. All right, and we'll be off, like that, standing in the presence of God. The Son of Man cometh. Shall he find that kind of faith? I don't need to tell you about this. This is, this is just a few references. I'm, I'm nearly done. I'm nearly finished. Just a few references on prayer. Matthew 26:41. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. 1 Timothy 2:8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubt. James 5:13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Mark 11:24. What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. And yeah, eventually God will give you an answer. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us. I want to finish with this quote. It comes from a book, Studies in Principles and Practice by Two English Brethren, a very good book. Prayer in the Modern World was their heading. Sporadic prayer is not sufficient for the urgent and returning needs of today. The tendency to evil is with us always, and if we are not to succumb repeatedly to its power, God must always be with us too. And this is a very important statement. Prayer and evil cannot live together. If one is present, the other must die. We must so order our life that we are constantly in touch with God throughout our waking hours. Like that widow, crying day and night. If you wanted final proof that we're on the verge of these things, it comes in Revelation chapter 3. There are seven letters Brother Thomas, Brother Mansfield and others have pointed out that those seven letters are actually a prophecy. They cover the period from John's time in AD 96 to our time when the Lord returns. The seventh of those letters is the one to lay it seal. It is the only one that has these words, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You don't find those words in any other letter. later sins. Poverty? Misery? Lining up at soup kitchens? No. Mm -hmm. Prosperity. As you say, we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. It's proof that he's going to come. He's going to come before there is a huge collapse of the world's economy and everybody knows that's coming soon. We're on the verge of being removed to the judgment seat of Christ. 2017 is a very important year. God works in 50 year cycles, doesn't he? 1917 to 1967, 1967, 2017. 1897, 1947, and so on you go. That's the way that works. Prayer is the antidote to the